What is up everybody? Welcome back to another Redstone episode. Today's episode, we're going to be going over the basic logic gates and we're going to be going over some more circuitry, trying to simplify them a little bit to help you guys implement them into your Redstone contraptions. To start off this whole shabacle, we're going to briefly go over inverting. Inverting is a very simple idea. It's basically saying that even though we start with power, we're not receiving any power at our wanted point. If we give power to this area, we then receive power, therefore inverting the signal. This seems like a really simple idea, but I promise you this will become very important. For example, if we take this simple inverting and give the potential for two inputs to this bottom block, suddenly we have ourselves an OR gate. This basically says that if either of these two lines give power to this block, we're going to receive a signal. Turn that on, boom, we get a signal. Turn this on, boom, we get a signal. OR gate. It's a really simple idea. There's a million different versions of all of these, honestly. I've tried to go through with the most basic ones, the ones that's easiest for you to see what is happening. So we can see here we have our basic inversion, just like the other side. We give this one signal, we lose it. This one signal, we lose it. OR gate. And while we're on the subject of OR gates, let's look at this funny little thing right here. What a double inversion? That seems extremely silly. Why in the world would you ever want to do this? Well, this right here, um, I guess if you're trying to power these blocks individually, I could see it. But truth be told, you probably would never use this on its own. It is redundant, but if we do the same thing we did with our OR gate and present the possibility for two signals to go into this block, suddenly we find ourselves with a NOR gate, which is just a regular OR gate with the signal inverted. This is saying that if we give signal to this block, we're going to lose our signal from up here. So we can see if we put one on this side, we lose the signal. On this side, lose the signal. This is a NOR gate. It is the exact same idea as the OR gate, like I said, just with the final signal inverted so that we're losing signal instead of getting signal. And now that I believe that you firmly understand the NOR gate from my repetitive explaining of it, we're gonna go ahead and look at the next logic gate, which is an AND gate. This right here, this logic gate is saying that if we want to receive power right here, both of our inputs have to be on at the same time. So we can see right here, if we flip this one, we're still not getting any power over there. But if we flip this one, suddenly we are getting power over there because we have power here and power here. This is our AND gate. I'd be willing to bet $2 that just by looking at this, you guys could tell me exactly what this logic gate is called. That's right, this logic gate is the NOT AND gate, the NAN gate. I personally have a fun time calling it the NANA gate, but let's move swiftly on from that. This, much like our regular AND gate, is saying that if we want to send signal over here to lose our signal, we must have a signal sent from this and this. So we can see, if we turn this, nothing. Flip this, then we lose our signal over here, a nana gate. And just like that, we've covered all the logic gates. I bet right now you're feeling like a million bucks, aren't you? You just learned a whole lot from this redstone video, right? Well, if you did, don't forget to leave a like and potentially subscribe because I plan on putting out a whole lot more about logic and just basic binary redstone. So let's do a quick recap of the logic gates. We have the OR gate, the AND gate, the NOR gate, and the NANA gate. I've been flying around my redstone world for 10 minutes trying to find the next section of this video. Oh man, I might be going a little crazy. Ha, <laughs> I finally found it, guys. So we're gonna start this next section out with talking about 
a little something that was brought to my attention a few weeks ago. So I did not realize that, I'm sure everybody knows, especially if you watched my last video, that when you put observers face to face together, they create an observer clock. They just start going absolutely crazy, right? Well, I have learned that there is a difference in speed between the player manually placing them face to face and pushing them into place. I believe it's a four and six as far as ticks go. So we can see this is like this. If we push this, it's very slight, but we are obviously getting much more tick rate out of the observers that were pushed together versus manually placed together. So for this next little bit, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna go over some clocks. So to start this off, we're gonna start with the burnout clock. Now this is using the function of the torch, the fact that it takes X amount of time to turn on and turn off. We're taking advantage of this to create ourselves a nice little clock. So we can see if we turn this off, every time the torch powers, it ends up powering this repeater, which sends signal into the block, which we then send back into this block, which turns the torch off briefly. As soon as the torch turns off, it loses the signal that it's sending to the repeater, which turns the repeater off, which shuts off our dust, which turns the torch back on. Therein, creating a clock. Now, the issue with this is it's not very variable. There's not much you can do with it. You can do some minimal adjusting, but you can see if you try to do that, it's just a constant signal. Oh, and it burnt out. We went a little too fast. Then if we come over here, we can see a little bit of a different layout. This is just an expansion of this, a little bit cleaner with no dust, but this is the same idea. Look how expensive this is. This is what, five repeaters for this clock? And if we turn it on, we can see, all right, now we're starting to get ourselves a bit of a clock. For our next segment of clocks, we're gonna be going over basic hopper clocks. This idea is fairly simple. What we're doing is we have one singular item in our chain of hoppers here. And every time that single item passes through this particular hopper, we're gonna get a signal from it, therefore creating a clock. But you can see if we unpower it, we get a little signal every so often. This is obviously extremely variable. You could add as many hoppers as you wanted but I wouldn't recommend it. You start piling up hoppers and you start getting some lag. There are some situations where this is useful. I've actually used some regular hopper clocks, just two hoppers going back and forth into each other, multiple times throughout my logic. So this is more useful in my opinion than this, but not by much. I would probably be kicked off of YouTube if I failed to mention, potentially, the most versatile clock there is, the Etho Hopper Clock. This thing is absolutely amazing. Now, for the sake of keeping it simple, I'm just going to give you a brief explanation of what's happening. We're using this redstone block to lock specific hoppers so that all the items have to funnel into the opposing hopper. Now, in doing so, you can see that while this one is locked, we are receiving a signal from here, but nothing from here. If we were to say suddenly take all of these items and put them over into, wait. Yeah, we gotta put them into this one. Why isn't that working? Oh, because I've locked it. <laughs> so if we unlock this, then we can see every time items go from one hopper to the other, it pushes it over, right? And as soon as this one loses all of its items, we very briefly, yep, see, very briefly lose power here, which allows this piston that's being powered to push over. Okay, okay. We gotta be a little careful now. I, I, I really like these Etho hopper clocks. I could go on and talk about them all day. We are gonna talk about why, in my opinion, they're the most versatile. That is simply because you can literally do any amount of time that you want. Anything from a single transfer up to infinity. It's, it's literally infinite. And I'm gonna show you how. So we can see right here that we have two of these clocks that are right next to each other linked with the comparator. 
So using the same logic as a normal one, this takes X amount of time. So in this case, I believe we have this full. So with this being full, this takes, I believe, what? Two minutes to empty, something around two minutes for this to completely empty, which means once every two minutes, it's sending a signal over to this clock, which allows it to send an item through. If you really want to start compounding the numbers, it starts getting really crazy. I'm going to show you a little bit about how crazy it can get. All I'm going to say is that I cannot imagine a world where you would need more than this right here. If you need more than this right here, you're doing something diabolical that you're not even going to be around to experience. And allow me to explain to you exactly why that is. So here I have my note, right? So it takes 128 seconds to move a full hopper. So that one right there that we have chuck full of five stacks takes 128 seconds to move all of those items. Now, if we were to take this and combine it with this, doing a whole bunch of math, this clock will activate once every 11, almost 11 and a half hours, okay? This every 11 and a half hours. What? I don't know why you would need something to time for more than 11 and a half hours, but on the very off chance that you do, let's take a look at what the numbers are if we add just one more clock. Taking a gander at this crazy math, we can see that by having one, two, three full Etho Hopper clocks, this third clock is only going to activate once every 48,320 days. That's a very long time. You're not going to be here for that. I guess unless you eat your vegetables then you could be around that long. And moving on to the last clock that I want to go over, this is a dropper hopper clock. I'm sure there are a billion different names out there, but the idea is extremely simple. So what we're doing here is we're saying that this hopper has an item in it right now that we currently have locked. If we were to release this item, it would send it into the dropper, which activates the comparator which activates right here, which is our rising edge monostable circuit, which will come up, activate all of this, which activates the dropper, shooting it back into the hopper, giving ourselves a nice little clock. So let's go ahead and turn this on so we can see. We have ourselves a nice little clock, right? Pretty compact, pretty noisy. It is a very mechanical clock. Uh, if we come over here, we're going to do the exact same thing, just with a little bit of a different configuration to give ourselves a bit of a different clock. This one, uh, I really like it because of how compact it is, uh, how easy it is, and just there's less of a chance for this in particular design to create any kind of quasi connectivity or anything like that. I don't use this one super often, but I do use it. Okay. So I've got two more sections that I want to go over with you guys real quick. Now, this next section is the real RS Snorlatch. I know last episode I miscalled something the RS Snorlatch. I apologize. I, despite the fact that it might seem like I know everything or a lot, I'm still learning, you know? Terminology is actually very important. Otherwise, people have no clue what you're talking about but the RS Snorlatch. So this is a very simple idea. This is saying that we're going to send signal in. Oh, wrong one. We're going to send signal in from up here. And no matter how many times we push this, nothing's going to change until we send in a signal down here. So this is another thing that I use a lot. This in particular design with the two droppers facing into each other and a comparator, did I, I unnecessarily use it. I will find reasons to put them into my contraptions. <laughs> Not really, but they are extremely useful. I love these a lot. So this is another just idea of the RS Snorlatch. This is more of a visual learning. So with this, we can see currently we have no signal, correct? See if we send the signal. All right. Oh man, but I keep sending signal here, but nothing's changing. 
until we send signal in over here. RS Norlatch, again, extremely useful. This is just another configuration, very simple. We can see, where do we start? We gotta start on this one to get our signal. No matter how many times we push it, nothing until we push this one. Very simple, but very, very useful. Okay, and for this last section, we're going to touch on observers again. I know I talked about them briefly in the last episode, but they are really such a versatile and useful tool that understanding them, in my opinion, will up your redstone game tenfold. So, observers, they observe the block in front of them where this little face is looking. They will send a signal every single time the block in front of it updates. So with this button, we're going to be sending two updates. Once when the button pushes in, and then once again, when the button comes back out. So we can see we push it. We got the one signal when it pushed in and the one signal when it pushes out. Same idea, you send one update to the block in front of it, you're gonna get one signal. Things to keep in mind is, much like with the button, there are some things that will send multiple signals. Every time a piston goes in front of an observer, you're going to get two signals for a full extension and retraction of the piston. With this, you've got to be really careful. If for some reason or in some way you accidentally have it set up so that when this observer powers, it ends up powering this piston again, you're going to find yourself with the most annoying noise machine on the planet. We can see we turn this on and then boom. That, oh man, that is so bad. We're going to turn that off. So you've just, you've really got to be careful when you're dealing with observers. You want to make sure that whatever they're getting as a update in front of them is the amount of signals that you actually want. So let's talk about what kind of effects we can use these observers for. The two most important ones, the ones that I use most often, are how they affect pistons and how they affect rails. So we can see that we have this directly set up to a piston. And truth be told, it wouldn't matter if there was a solid block or something in front of this piston either. We can see that when we send it a signal, our sticky piston pushed up the observer but didn't pull it back down. It's because we are sending it such a fast tick that it doesn't have time to register that it pulled it up, stopped, and came back down. So this, again, this is something that I use constantly, absolutely constantly. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a uh, machine of mine that doesn't use this in some way or another. Now, the last thing that I really wanna talk about when it comes to observers is the powered rail. So what this is doing and presenting for us is instant signal transfer right so if we can take here we sit here and we can see obviously we would think that with power coming out of the back end of this this block would receive signal long before this block did right so we come back over here we can see that they activated instantaneously at the exact same time that helps so much honestly it's not very often you'll see me run a line of redstone anymore, unless I absolutely have to. This is how I transfer my signal, and then I just convert it back into power wherever I actually need it. But with doing this, you can think this is the longest you can go with each segment. Nine blocks. When a power rail gets powered, it can only power itself plus eight more blocks in either direction. So... With this, there is the opportunity, if we come over here and look, for 37 outputs per signal. Now, I don't know if we're gonna be able to see them all, but we can see if we send this, every single one of these observers received their signal at the exact same time. <laughs> That's just running off nine rails right here. We're getting 37 instantaneous outputs. That, again, that has helped me so much with timings, just running, just everything, everything redstone. I'm using observers left and right. I highly recommend you play around with them. Get to know them, mess up, hop into a creative world just like this and just start playing with them. They are so useful and they are so fun. But I do think that is going to wrap us up for today. 
I hope you guys enjoyed, and I hoped you learned something. If there's anything that you in particular want information on or would like to see me do a video about, let me know down in the comments. I have been going redstone crazy and I'm rearing to come up with some new ideas. So please, give me some. Thanks anyways guys, have a good one.